for some of you who have been to the symposium in the, in the past, I think a lot of this will be review, but I've tried to add in a few things that will be new for everybody. Right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I have nothing to disclose. I'm not important enough for that. <laughs> I'll give you a little lecture outline. We're going to talk about the history and the cardinal motor features of Parkinson's disease first. We're going to delve deep into gait and balance problems in Parkinson's disease because that can be an important contributor to falls. We'll talk about the changes in the brain that actually underlie Parkinson's disease. We'll talk a little bit about the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And then we'll go into current areas of research uh, as it pertains to gait dysfunction. So starting off, the history and cardinal motor features of Parkinson's disease. Um, so last year was actually a really important year uh, for Parkinson's disease because it marked the 200th anniversary of Dr. James Parkinson's essay on the shaking palsy where he describes the disease. Uh, and I just wanted to read you a little excerpt from, from that uh, from that paper, he says, so slight and imperceptible are the first inroads of this malady, and so extremely slow its progress that it rarely happens that the patient can form any recollection of the precise period of its commencement. The first symptoms perceived are a slight sense of weakness and a proneness to trembling, most commonly in one of the hands. After a few more months, the patient is found to be less strict than usual in preserving an upright posture. Walking becomes a task which cannot be performed without considerable attention. The legs are not raised to that height or with that promptitude which the will directs so that the utmost care is necessary to prevent frequent falls. Um, so if you do a quick Google search for James Parkinson's, you'll, James Parkinson, you'll, you'll likely turn up this picture. Uh, the interesting thing is that James Parkinson, as the photo suggests, died in 1824, which was a couple of years before photography was invented. Um, so I did a little bit of reading about who this person might actually be, and it is a James Parkinson, uh, but it's likely a dude named James Carmine Parkinson, who was uh, in the British Royal Navy. And despite having an excellent beard, as many neurologists do, uh, I don't think he actually contributed anything to the study of neurologic disease. Um, so anyway, in 1817, this essay is published, and over the years, uh, Parkinson disease is, or, or paralysis agitans, or the shaking palsy, as it was called at that time, gains increasing uh, attention, and the description is expanded upon, uh, maybe none more so than by this man uh, pictured in this photo with the red arrow, uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, and he recommends that it's called, uh, Park, uh, that it be named after Dr. Parkinson. Um, Dr. Parkinson's, you know, even that early description of the disease is, is pretty remarkably accurate, especially given that he only describes six patients, three of whom he didn't really know, two that he just sort of met on the street, and one whom he just saw at a distance. Uh, but he got a lot of things right. Not everything, but a lot. So next, I, I just wanted to start talking about the, the cardinal motor features of the disease. And before we, we get too much into talking about symptoms, I just want to preface it by saying that every Parkinson's patient has a different course. Everybody has different symptoms. So I may say things here, you say, well, that didn't happen to me. Well, that's true, because uh, one of the first things up here that we're going to talk about is tremor. And while it's one of the uh, most characteristic things about Parkinson's disease, there's about 15% of patients that never get it. Um, so with that little bit, we'll delve right in. Uh, so tremor. As opposed to a lot of other conditions that cause tremor, the tremor in Parkinson's disease is usually one that happens when you're not doing anything at all. When your hand is just resting by your side or it's in your lap, and if you do something with it or you even think about doing something with it, the tremor will often go away. It can come back if you're doing some kind of sustained task, like I've had many patients tell me that if they're gripping their steering wheel, that's when the tremor will come out. Um, the next cardinal motor symptom is rigidity. So what is rigidity? It's the resistance of a joint to passive movement. So what does that mean? Well, in clinic, um, you might have seen us take somebody, uh, take a Parkinson's patient's wrist and move it around, and we're looking to see whether there's sort of a resistance to that motion. 
It may not actually cause any symptoms, but some patients will tell me that you know, they just feel stiffer. And if you watch as a patient with Parkinson's walk, you might notice that one arm is swinging less than the other, and that probably has something to do with rigidity as well. Uh, this third item, the bradykinesia, hypokinesia, and akinesia, which literally translates to slow, small, and absent movement respectively, is a little bit complicated. There's this tendency in Parkinson's disease for everything, you to do, everything that you do to be smaller, less frequent, less robust, and this can manifest in a variety of ways. Just general spontaneity, you know, motioning as you talk uh, tends to be less, expressiveness of the face tends to be less, voice becomes softer, handwriting becomes smaller. We can test for bradykinesia and hypokinesia formally in clinic by doing things like finger taps, which often start out slow and small, and then as they continue, get even smaller than that. Um, bradykinesia, hypokinesia, and akinesia also have important ramifications for gait, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then the last item is postural instability. And so what does that mean? Um, so your body is sort of programmed to respond to some kind of perturbation. So you, if you get knocked off balance, you have this automatic response that brings you back into an upright posture. Well, in Parkinson's disease, that reflex is impaired, and that could be important for uh, balance problems and falls as well, which we'll get into. And then even though it's not a cardinal motor feature, I think that this illustration um, on the right side of the slide uh, by Sir William Gower uh, demonstrates another feature, which is the, the stooping of posture, which uh, Dr. Parkinson described in his paper, which you can see here. Now, to go over the things that we just talked about, I have a few videos that we can watch. Lift up your shoulders. A man with signs and symptoms of PD on the right side of the body, including decreased shrug of the shoulder. Rest like this a minute. Rest the tremor, tremor of the right hand that reemerges when the arm sustains a posture against gravity. Okay. This next video is demonstrating rigidity. It's a little bit hard to appreciate rigidity in a video. As I was saying, you know, we move wrists around and ankles around and we can feel rigidity. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to just appreciate on a video, but I think this one does a pretty good job. Shoulder rigidity manifested by decreased arm swing with passive movement of the shoulders. This is the same man as in video 1-10. He has predominantly left-sided PD. When left his shoulders are passively less. moved, the involved arm moves with the decreased amplitude owing to rigidity. And here's, here's a video demonstrating that akinesia, bradykinesia, and hypokinesia, which by the way, for simplicity, we often just refer to under the umbrella term bradykinesia. Akinesia, bradykinesia, hypokinesia. Thank you, Tonya. Can you shrug your shoulders for me? A man with Parkinson's disease, PD, seen in the morning prior to his first dose of levodopa, his last dose having been 12 hours earlier. He had lost facial expression, with lips parted, slow tongue movements, and very slow movements of his limbs, left worse than right. Okay. How about the left hand? Can you? How about the doorknob? If I think about it, if I think about it, you just... Okay, once I get going, I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. With your right foot, hard as you can. Now, would you do your left, please? I, I wish I had a video of him after he took his first dose of carbidopa levodopa because the, the change that you can see can, can often be very dramatic, as I'm sure many of you know. And this, this is a video of something called the pull test, which gets at that postural instability thing I was talking about. This is a normal pull test, which is, as you'll see in the video, 
we get patients to stand with a, a comfortable distance apart of their feet and then we pull back from the shoulders and they're to take a step back to stabilize themselves. Taking up to two steps is normal, but anything more than that uh, is considered abnormal postural stability. Normal pull test. The pull test is performed to assess postural reflexes. This man, the same person as in videos 1-10 and 1-13 with mild PD, has a normal pull test. He recovered with one step. And so as I mentioned, I, I want to sort of micro-focus on gait and balance problems in Parkinson's disease. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that play into uh, gait dysfunction, and I think that it's instructive to just take a step back and think about how complicated walking is. You know, think about you know a, a baby, it takes them a, a year or more to, to learn how to take their first step, and they're not walking halfway normally until they're four or five years old. Um, little known fact, in, in college I came in as an electrical engineer uh, with a plan to, to go into robotics, and I used to go to these robotics competitions, and one of the things you realize very quickly is that no one is designing their robots um, to walk on two feet. They're always rolling, or they're hovercrafts, or they're flying, because walking is just too hard. You're having to shift your weight from one leg to the other, from front to back. You're having to adjust for distractions in the environment, uneven terrain. It's really, really hard. Um, and so I think that, that goes into why gait um, is such an important factor in Parkinson's disease. There we go. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it, as I mentioned. To, as I mentioned, uh, one of those things is probably cognitive functioning. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, there's there's an impaired ability to multitask, or there can be. Um, you've probably heard people joke that you know they they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, in Parkinson's disease, for some patients, even performing really basic tasks as they're walking can be very challenging. Uh, in the clinic, if you're if you recognize a few familiar faces out here, if you're one of my patients, you probably have noticed that when we're walking in the hallway, I have a tendency to talk to you, and I'm actually watching to see whether you have to pause to respond back to me. And if you do, it actually has been shown to be a, a predictor of falls because it, it implies that there is a difficulty in multitasking. in trouble advancing this slide. There we go. Um, this next video is um, looking at bradykinesia and hypokinesia as gait. We had sort of talked about it uh, with regard to finger tapping, but it also goes into gait function. So steps tend to become shorter, the stride length. They also, there also is a reduced clearance so that the feet are picked up less off of the ground. And, and to an ex if that goes to an extreme, there's a, a shuffling quality to gait. Uh, and you can imagine that if there was a rug or a threshold, you could catch your toe on it and that could cause a, a, a fall. Um, so here's a patient that has um, a shuffling bradykinetic gait. So if we know that not picking up the feet enough is, is an important feature of Parkinsonian gait and one that can lead to falls, what do we do about it? Well, some of you may have heard of big and loud therapy before, um, which is all about retraining your gait, uh, at least the, the big part of that is about retraining your gait to take larger steps, pick up your feet more so that there's less of a risk that you're going to snag your foot. Has anybody participate in big and loud therapy before? Was it a benefit? Yeah? We're a big fan of it. Mm. 
So, as I was talking about earlier when we were talking about finger tapping, you not only are movements small and slow, there's a tendency for them to get smaller. And that can be true of gait too. Um, steps might start out you know, reasonably big, but then as patients continue to walk, sometimes those steps are getting shorter and shorter and smaller and smaller. You can kind of think about it as like uh, a marble dropping. You know, The first bounce is a big bounce, and then the next one's a smaller one, and the next one's a smaller one, and smaller and smaller. And like a marble, sometimes the, um, the steps have a, a tendency to speed up as well. Um, Dr. Parkinson recognized this quality in Parkinsonian patients and said the following. In some cases, the patient can no longer exercise himself by walking in his usual manner, but is thrown on the toes and forefront of the feet, being at the same time irresistibly impelled to take much quicker and shorter steps, and thereby to adopt unwillingly a running pace. In some cases, it is found necessarily entirely to substitute running for walking, since otherwise the patient, on proceeding only a, few, a very few paces, would inevitably fall. So this is festination of gait. Could you stand up, please? Festinating gait. When walking, this man with PD is leaning forward too much, so his center of gravity is in front of his feet. The result is that he runs, festinates, to prevent falling. He stops by reaching a wall to support himself. Okay, come back towards me. Okay, go back towards your wife, please. Do you want her to help you so you don't fall? Okay. Come back towards me. So one of the things you may have noticed there is that when he reaches a wall, he can sort of reach out his arm, embrace himself, and stop himself from continuing to go forward. Uh, and we have have recognized, you know, that that might be a helpful thing in terms of adaptive devices. Uh, and there's now a, a special kind of walker called a U-step walker that some of you may use. Um, a general walker either doesn't have any brakes on it at all, or it has brakes that engage only when you squeeze the handlebars. The U-step walker is kind of the reverse. In order to make it go, you have to squeeze the handlebars, and then if you let them go, it will stop. So you can imagine that if you were having festination of your gait where you're going faster and faster, all you have to do is let go of the handlebars, the brakes engage, and you can brace yourself and keep yourself from continuing to go forward. So we were just talking about bradykinesia and hypokinesia of gait, uh, but Akinesia of gait, the absence of movement, can also contribute to balance and falls. You can imagine a situation where you're walking and suddenly you're not able to make the next step and the top half of your body is going forward but your feet aren't going anywhere and that can throw you off balance. Um, so freezing of gait happens in a few different situations for patients. Sometimes it's pretty unpredictable, uh, but common things that uh, can trigger freezing of gait is gait initiation. So when you're first getting up out of a chair and trying to walk, going through a narrow space or trying to make a turn are the most common conditions. We have a video of that. There we go. Freezing when turning and when starting to walk. When walking, this man with PD has freezing of gait, even when other signs of PD have responded to levodopa therapy. In these scenes, the patient is walking in the straight corridor without freezing of gait, but freezing occurs when he turns and sometimes when he starts to walk again. Any, 
he almost took a spill there, as you saw. And as the video alluded to, um, freezing of gait can respond to dopamine replacement, to carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamet, uh, but it doesn't always. And so we have to think of other ways to address freezing of gait. Um, so one of the interesting things about Parkinson's disease is that it doesn't actually cause weakness. People will, will tell me sometimes that they feel weak. I've had patients describe freezing to me as a sudden feeling of weakness, like they just can't move anymore. But it's all more about accessing movements, accessing motor programs, saying in your mind that you want to take a next step and then actually having that happen. Uh, and interestingly, there seems to be more of a difficulty with um, trying to make those movements yourself as opposed to having some kind of external cue. The classic example of this is a patient that is severely affected with Parkinson's, having a lot of difficulty making movements, walking, but if there's a fire in the house, they can suddenly run outside. Uh, sometimes that's referred to as paradoxical kinesia. There's less extreme examples, of course. I've heard of patients that um, will use a metronome, like a pocket metronome, and listen to the beats and step in time with those, and that can help uh, them take their next steps. And here's an example of that. Overcoming akinesia. Part of that is it is very slow. You just catch yourself. You mm -hmm. can have a seat. This man has PD and has trouble initiating or maintaining movement. I've been difficult to know in walking and so on. Yes. But if you don't mind. No, go ahead. Yeah. By chasing a bouncing ball, he can move quickly. You're pretty good with that. Isn't he amazing? His coordination is excellent. That is really some demonstration. You learned that on your own? By bouncing the ball on the floor and going after it, he is able to arise from the chair more quickly. In other words, getting out of the chair without using that trick, you, you have trouble doing that. Yeah. And what about the handkerchief uh, trick? By purposefully reaching for a handkerchief, he can initiate the movement of an arm that otherwise would be akinetic. Sometimes my hand, you know, when it gets stuck here, I don't move it. So I would lose this handkerchief to catch it in this way. So I know that if I had to bounce a ball every time I walked, I would lose that ball well, within about three minutes or so. So we've had to think of more practical ways to, to help patients that uh, have freezing. And one of the ways that we've addressed this is to have walkers that have laser lights on them. So the laser light shines on the floor and provides that external cue to take the next step. Patients step over the laser light uh, and then again and again and move with the walker. I have a brief video uh, of that that I stole from YouTube. And the U-step walker can be fitted with one of these as well. So we looked at earlier an example of a normal pull test, but now I wanted to look at an abnormal pull test because this postural instability is also a major contributor to falls. Um, while we test this by yanking people back on their shoulders in clinic, you know, there are, of course, other situations that are probably more realistic to your environment. Hopefully, people aren't yanking you back by the shoulders in your everyday life. Um, but just you know, walking on an uneven surface or bumping into a wall is enough to throw some patients off balance. And so testing, um, testing by the pull test is sort of a surrogate for that information. Examples of abnormal positive pull tests. You over you keep your balance. Ready? All right. You can take a step. This man failed to recover his balance in two steps or fewer. Comfortable? I'm going to pull you this way towards me. Ready? This woman's pull test showed more severe impairment. It took a less forceful pull to make her lose her balance. 
So I'm going to pull you also, but this time backwards. You can put your feet apart a little bit because you have to recover on your own. Are you ready? This woman's pull test showed even greater abnormality. She failed even to step backward, retropulsion. Want to try that again? So then we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the changes in the brain that underlie Parkinson's disease. So why does Parkinson's disease happen in the first place? Uh, some of this may get a little bit complicated, but we'll, we'll try and get through it. And if you have questions about it, you can, you can ask me at the end. So the issue in Parkinson's disease has something to do with the function of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are deep structures within the brain. They have individual names, uh, some of which you may know, like the globus pallidus or the subthalamic nucleus. And what the basal ganglia do is a little bit unclear, but they have something to do with selecting which movements to make, which ones not to make and the vigor with which movements are performed. So the speed, the size, the power of movements. And the reason that the basal ganglia are dysfunctional in Parkinson's disease has a lot to do with a signaling molecule, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Um, so if we were to think of the basal ganglia as being like the car that makes you move, dopamine is sort of like the gasoline. If you have more gasoline around, more dopamine, you're going to make more and faster movements. If you have less dopamine, you're going to make less and slower movements. Uh, dopamine is stored and secreted from uh, this little area in the back of the brain, in the, in the brain stem, called the substantia nigra, which, which literally just means black substance. Well, the cells that store and secrete dopamine are lost in Parkinson's disease, and you can see in this picture that you have a normal, what we call a control brain with this very dark line in it showing that those cells are healthy and active, whereas in Parkinson's patients, there's less dark staining uh, showing that those cells have been lost. And so now the dopamine isn't around, which means that the basal ganglia can't function as well as they're supposed to, which means that movements are gonna become slower and smaller. So then that leads us into the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So if we know that the problem has something to do with a lack of this signaling molecule, this neurotransmitter called dopamine, it just makes good common sense that the treatment should have something to do with giving dopamine back. Um, this sounds really simple, but it took us a long time to even realize that loss of dopamine was the problem. And then once we realized uh, that loss of dopamine was the problem, we had to figure out how to get it into a pill that would actually then get into the brain. So we don't give regular dopamine in a pill because if we did, it would get broken down in the stomach. We give a dopamine precursor. That's the levodopa part of your carbidopa levodopa pills that then goes into the brain and gets converted to dopamine. Um, so just as a historical side note, uh, we figured out uh, that we needed to give levodopa to patients with Parkinson's in 1967, um, or that's when we, we came up with these pills. Um, back in ancient India, Parkinson's disease was described around 600 BC, and they actually found a plant that contained natural levodopa around 300 BC, so they, they beat us on it by just a little bit. <laughs> If anybody tells you that American healthcare is behind the times, you say, man, you have no idea. <laughs> there we go. So now we do know that dopamine is one of the main problems, and so there's a lot of drugs that are aimed at either giving dopamine back or making the dopamine that you have in your brain last longer. So I've sort of grouped these into a, a few different categories. Carbidopa, levodopa, the levodopa part, again, being converted to dopamine in the brain. Uh, there's various formulations of that. We have Cinemet, which is the basic formulation. We have an extended release called Cinemet CR, an even newer extended release called Ritari, um, and then uh, intestinal gel pump that is sort of provides continuous uh, carbidopa, levodopa that's called Duopa. And then there's a class called the dopamine agonist. So these medications aren't dopamine per se, uh, but they bind to the receptors in the brain that dopamine would normally bind to, to sort of trick the brain into thinking that dopamine is there when it's not there. 
And there's a few different ones of those that we use. In terms of the dopamine extending drugs, these uh, work by inhibiting the breakdown of dopamine in the brain, and they come in a couple different forms, a couple different classes. We have the MAOB inhibitors, like selegiline and resagiline, and the CM COMT inhibitors, which is mainly in tacopone. It's probably the one that you've heard of, or Comtan. So where does dopamine fall short? Um, Dopamine replacement can do a lot in terms of treating the slowness or the bradykinesia, the stiffness or the rigidity and tremor in Parkinson's disease, but that improvement's incomplete. You know, if you have symptoms, it's a rare situation where we give the medication and everything completely resolves, and that's particularly true of later in the disease. Then there are other features of Parkinson's, uh, both mo motor and non-motor features, that don't really improve a dopamine replacement at all. Um, to address some of the non-motor features, uh, which will be covered a little bit more in another lecture, uh, things I've probably asked you about in clinic or your other doctors have asked you about in clinic, low blood pressure, constipation, urinary difficulties, sexual dysfunction, skin changes, loss of smell, various sleep problems, cognitive changes, depression, anxiety, apathy, delusions, hallucinations, fatigue, pain, and restlessness, these are all things that can happen in Parkinson's disease, and most of them don't improve with dopamine replacement, and some of them can even get worse with dopamine replacement. Then on the motor side as well, we have some things that don't tend to re respond to uh, dopamine replacement, and some of them are really important for preventing uh, gait and, uh, for, uh, as, as it pertains to falls. So postural instability, which we test with the pull test, uh, doesn't tend to respond to dopamine replacement. Some types of freezing of gait, as we mentioned, don't really seem to respond to, to dopamine replacement. And then sometimes tremor doesn't either. So what's going on here? I think basically it has to do with it's not, not just about dopamine. There are other signaling molecules in the brain which are deficient in Parkinson's disease. They have names like acetylcholine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and glutamate. And then it's not just about the basal ganglia either. There's uh, areas of the brain like the cerebral cortex, the brain stem in the back, the cerebellar pathways, and the autonomic nervous system that become impacted in Parkinson's disease. And so accordingly, we've started to, to shift our focus to, to therapies that aren't directed right at dopamine. Uh, so many of the therapies for the non-motor features, um, like treating depression, we have medications that increase serotonin, uh, which is another signaling molecule. We treat low blood pressure in a variety of ways, but one of them, one of the newer ones, is a medication called droxidopa, which increases norepinephrine uh, in, the, in the bloodstream. Um, the motor features of Parkinson's disease that don't respond to dopamine replacement, particularly postural instability and freezing of gait, represent a major treatment challenge because we haven't quite figured out what we need to give back, what we need to do to make those symptoms better. So current areas of research as it pertains to gait dysfunction and Parkinson's disease we'll spend just a little bit of time on. Um, oops. So given that the disability can be, that can be associated with gait dysfunction and falls in Parkinson's, uh, there's been a lot of interest in therapies that might be able to help with those issues uh, when dopamine replacement alone is ineffective. We talked about various neurotransmitters, the signaling molecules that are deficient in Parkinson's disease, and it's possible that one or more of these is involved in the gait dysfunction that we see uh, that doesn't respond to dopamine replacement. So for freezing of gait, for example, we've tried medications like amantadine, which um, works through a, a, a glutamate signaling pathway, so glutamate is another neurotransmitter, and atomoxetine, which works through a norepinephrine signaling pathway to see whether those could help with gait. And there's some limited evidence that in some patients they may, um, but so far the, the level of ed evidence is not very robust. In recent years, there's been uh, a lot of interest in the neurotransmitter acetylcholine 
uh, and the role that that might play in gait and balance dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. So there was a small trial in 2010 that looked at ac uh, acetylcholine increasing drug called denepazil, which you may have heard of, and found that um, patients that were taking that had a 50% reduction in falls as compared to patients that were taking a placebo. This was a six-week trial, I think, with 23 patients. So not a huge sample size, but, but definitely interesting. And it was enough to pique our interest, and we're actually having... Um, have an ongoing trial here at University of Michigan using a different drug called varenicycline to see whether that could have uh, an impact on gait and balance. So we've just been talking about medication so far, but I'm sure many of you are aware of deep brain stimulation or DBS for Parkinson's disease. Um, so what is DBS? We implant these, or I should say neurosurgery implants electrodes into the deep parts of the brain, the basal ganglia, and by uh, applying a small amount of electrical current, we can achieve a lot of the same benefits that medication can uh, while avoiding some of the side effects of medications and some of the fluctuations of on-off periods. And generally we say that DBS isn't going to do better than uh, your medications are. Your best on state with medications, DBS isn't going to outperform that. But there's an exception to that. We know that tremor that doesn't really respond to medications can get better uh, with deep brain stimulation. And it got us to thinking, are there other things that deep brain stimulation is better than medications for? Uh, and one of the areas uh, that we're interested in is DBS for gait and balance dysfunction. Um, specifically, there's this area of the brain uh, in the brain stem called the pedunculo pontine nucleus, uh, and people have looked at whether applying stimulation to that uh, could potentially be helpful. The results so far of those trials have been pretty mixed, but it's, uh, it's an ongoing area of interest, as is um, sort of the way in which we supply stimulation. So right now, if you come into clinic and you have a deep brain stimulator, um, we adjust either the, the voltage or the current on the device and it just kind of provides that same setting until you see us back in clinic again. Um, but some people are looking at, well, maybe it would be better if the current and the voltage could be adjusted in real time based, to, based on feedback, uh, either from the brain itself or based on how your tremor is doing. Uh, and that's called closed loop DBS, which is an ongoing uh, area of interest. And there's some thought that that could help uh, with gait and balance as well. So a lot of things to be excited about, but unfortunately, we're, we're just not quite there yet. Thanks so much for having me.